Welcome to Uncommon Sense, where we do our best to make it common again. I'm your host, Adrian Alquist, and today I'm joined by Dr. Joshua Russell, who is the headmaster of the Chesterton Academy of the Sacred Heart, which is in Peoria, Illinois. How are you, Josh? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for, for having me uh, having me on, uh, Adrian. I appreciate it, and uh, it's good to, good to be here. Doing very well. On this hey, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, you're a very impressive person. I say that a lot about a lot of our guests, but you have a very um, well-rounded background, which is very Chestertonian. And part of part of the point of the podcast is to promote the Chesterton Schools Network. And part of how we do that is to introduce people to the the interesting and you know amazing people that we have on staff in you know all across the schools. So um, I want to ask you about your background before. I ask you how you came to Chesterton and how you became a headmaster of Chesterton Academy. So you, you, I shed some light on that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. It's very kind. I My background before coming to, to Chesterton was primarily as a concert pianist, uh, have traveled nationally and internationally as a, as a concert pianist, and also taught for almost 10 years at the university level as a professor at a, a variety of institutions, primarily in the Midwest, a couple of years at Cornell College. Uh, a couple of years at Bradley University, and then uh, a few years at Illinois State University, uh, primarily in the in the music field, teaching some music history classes, had uh, graduate and undergraduate piano students, uh, counseled them in career development and things like that. That's the kind of the bulk of my background before coming to Chesterton. Wow. We're going to have to talk about piano related stuff because I'm also a pianist. Uh, not as impressive as you are, not as, as uh, I'm not a professional, <laughs> but I can carry a conversation, hopefully on that. Uh, but, but uh, that's amazing. I, I read that you're also a pilot. Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's true. I have a commercial rated pilot in airplanes with uh, flight instructor rating in airplanes. I fly helicopters a little bit too, but uh, yeah, that's a, that's an interest that has gone back uh, to my family as a kid. And, and I uh, learned to fly when I was fairly young and uh, have instructed for a number of years. I have a lot of interest, you know, again, Chester Tony, <laughs> yeah. to be able to, to, to appreciate the many, many great things of this world. Yeah, seriously. And, and so uh, was Chesterton, Chesterton an inspiration for that? Or did you come to know Chesterton later? The, the writer? I came to know Chesterton, Chesterton later. Really. I knew of him, knew of many of his great quotes and so forth, and had read a little bit of him, but it was really later in life coming to, to, uh, to understand his style of writing, a lot of his philosophy, the sense of wonder and awe, I think of all the things. I'm sure that resonated with you, right? Very much so. That sense Mm -hmm. of beauty, awe, and wonder at the world around us. That was, I'd say, the first thing that really resonated with me. That's amazing. Uh, So you said you taught at Cornell. What made you... What made you leave and uh, and <laughs> work so, with with a high school? No, so, so this is Cornell College. It's a small college in in Iowa. It's a small uh, liberal arts school that I taught at there. Cornell College, not the university. Gotcha. That Cornell makes sense. College. Okay, I, I that and, still impressive though. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So I taught for a couple of years while I was working on my doctorate in piano performance. Uh, I had the opportunity to actually take a faculty position for a couple of years there. And then uh, received the offer to come back into uh, Central Illinois, which is actually the area that my wife and I are originally from. So we're we're from uh, not too far away from where we're at right now. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, cool. So, uh, but yeah, what what made you want to uh, go to a high school rather than teach at the college level? Was it something well, about I, the Chester Academy? Yeah, I appreciate that question. I loved I loved working with the students. I had a lot of of students from all over the world. I had uh, eight different countries in my piano studio at the time that I left, and uh, they were they were very successful in competitions and jobs. and And the students were were wonderful. And uh, you know, traveling as a pianist was was great at times. That sometimes that can that'll wear on you with a large and growing family. But um, mm-hmm. you know, essentially, you know, working in the the university environment, particularly in the secular university world, there was an expectation on the faculty, on the professors, to not simply you know accept, but to actively promote a lot of ideology that that frankly was not consistent with uh, my lifestyle, my family's lifestyle, and and our faith. And I really desired, uh, first of all, to be in an environment where you could tie everything, all subject matter to the faith. And then I would say, say secondly, I really saw the need and the importance you know, working with these, uh, these college students, undergraduates, uh, particularly the, the need for strong formation in the high school years, that they, they really learn how to articulate ideas, their faith to, to, uh, to defend it, but to, to evangelize, to, to embrace it and, uh, and grow in their their personal identity as a, as a child of God in those high school years, and, and really desired to to be a part of that formation. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's it's teaching at that level because I'm a teacher at at uh, our Twin Cities Chesterton Academy, and I teach yeah. Calc and, and Stats. 
uh, yeah, it, it seems like it's more of an investment. It's, it's a really good investment because the, the learning that you can do at that age level will go on to, you know, have, have ripple effects later in life and, and either bad ones or good ones. And we hope we, we yeah, that, that makes sense. I yeah. Agree. It really, it really, this really prepares them for that next step of life, whatever it's going to be. And, and you get to sit here, you get to sit here and, and, and watch them, you know, as the students in high school come in, they, they come in somewhat still as children. You know, they, they have a lot right. of, a lot of passion and energy and ideas, but they, they come in here young, but they, they very much leave as young men and women. And to, to get to watch that step and to, to get to, to be a part of that coming alongside the parents and, and assisting them and reinforcing what they're doing with these kids, it's, it's, it's really, a, it's a real honor. It's a real privilege that we get to have. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. I entered uh, Chester Academy because I also went to the school that I was teaching at, uh, that I am teaching at. And I was, um, you know, very immature, I would say. And <laughs> Chesterton helped me grow out of that immaturity, but also you know, develop my intellect and my spiritual life. It, it's, it was amazing. And I assume uh, you, you see a similar um, uh, progression for your students we, at you, there. Yeah. We, absol- we absolutely do. The ability to articulate ideas. But we actually, we actually were just able to, we were able to, to hold a, you know, a small uh, concert last night with our choir, our singers, for, uh, for just our parents and, and the, the, the student siblings. And in that, in that concert, I have a, uh, our four seniors. They were, this is our first year. This is our fourth year. It's our first year to graduate students who have been with us for four years and oh, wow. four senior men who are actually singing in a quartet. And you know, they, they not only sounded great last night, but to see them take the stage with uh, a lot of confidence, they have a presence about them, uh, a mm-hmm. purpose about them when they walked out there to, to sing their quartet piece. It really, um, you know, we wouldn't have seen that when we were freshmen, but we see it very much now. And uh, that's a great moment when you get to see that fruit in, in such, a, such oh, yeah. an obvious way. Oh yeah, I, I was in our quartet back when we were in high school, and and it was a very great experience. I mean, you what's what's great is you can pursue whatever you want at Chesterton. Right. It's not like we put too much emphasis on one particular thing. We don't put too much emphasis on sports, but we have sports, and you can right. pursue whatever type of thing you, that you want, and you can excel in any type of field. That's what's great is is um, you know sometimes you are forced to excel in STEM or in the arts, depending on what the school yes. is. But what, what's great is you you have a certain um, you know freedom to to explore what you want, but you are forced to take everything so that you you know you I mean you you have more opportunity to to uh, explore all of these different fields. It's just it's great. I, would you agree with that? I, I love that. I, that's one of the things that I love about it. You know, everybody takes everything in the curriculum. They they do a lot of the extracurriculars, and every student is going to find something. Maybe they didn't realize it when they started. They're going to find something that they're really excellent at, and then mm-hmm. they're all going to find something that's a little bit more challenging for them. And um, yeah. there's there's just so many great lessons in all of that. Leadership for the the students that are great at this or not this. Well, they they start to help to pull each other along. It, it forms leadership. It forms mm-hmm. confidence. We see, especially in the arts program, I see students finding skills and talents they had no idea that they had. I know. And it it, it just it's it, it is it's that well roundedness. It exposes them to things that they would not otherwise try. Um, sometimes they end up really loving it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for you, practically speaking, it was really, it's really helpful for you to be re- well-rounded because you're, you, you have to teach all these different classes. You're not only a headmaster. Can you go into depth of what you, you teach there at Chesterton? Yeah, I love this. So it's a, you know, a teaching headmaster position. You get to know the students really well. I teach, uh, I lead the choir. I lead our students' choir and, and teach the music portion of the program. But I'm also teaching a part of the history sequence, I teach literature and uh, have taught, uh, you know, and do some of the writing that we have. We've had it, you know, the writing, a lot of it's wrapped up in the literature and applies to all the classes, but uh, I've dealt with those. So history, literature, and, and music are the primary ones mm-hmm. and uh, that, that I've worked with. I've taught the full li- literature sequence in a couple of the history classes. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, I really, I do want to talk about the the music. Um, let's, let's just get into it because we can talk, we can, integ- we can integrate it and we can talk about why music is integrated and important into the in the, in the curriculum. So, uh, so what made you want to be a, a pianist in the first place? Well, first um, of all, we have an unfortunate name. Uh, I wish we could say it pianist, 
but but it's it's we got to take that hit <laughs> it's, that, it's a, a piano player we should say <laughs> the piano player the piano player you're right i, know. I just know i have to enunciate I, that's that's the one thing not to <laughs> not to put ourselves down but yeah <laughs> that's no, that's all right you know i uh it's i think that uh so as a kid i had i took piano lessons my parents put me into piano lessons when i was young and uh, maybe a little older than some but about third grade or so and I got to be really honest with you. I really hated it. I didn't like it at all. Same. When I that's was, that's when funny. I, yeah. Know, this wasn't. And so I don't know. Maybe there's a lesson in this too. You know, they just made me keep taking lessons. You're going to keep doing it. You're going to keep doing it. And uh, the first time that I really started to enjoy it was about the junior high level. I got to accompany the choir at my school. You know, pianists. We sometimes, uh, as as young uh, young players, are um, at a disadvantage. Other instruments have band, choir, singer, uh, band or orchestra. Singers have choir. We're kind of stuck in the room. I remember sitting there when my friends were out playing baseball, and I was yeah. there by myself. You know, practicing the piano. But I had that that experience of kind of the community and the music playing with an ensemble, and I was really hooked. And and continued to play through the high school years, you get to a place where you can play music that, that sounds beautiful, that, that's uh, really satisfying. You get to a company, you get to do some chamber music, things like that. And, and that was the point when I really wanted to make that a uh, you know, primary, primary path in my career. Uh, was having that opportunity. Well, so, when did so when that, did you have that that breakthrough? Because for me, I also didn't really like piano the first, I don't know, five years that I was playing it. I, I started in second grade and and I really didn't like it until around seventh grade. I remember I played a Chopin piece that I I really liked and I I learned it um, against my my piano teacher's wishes because we were still doing stuff that was more you know rudimentary and I wanted to do this this classical this romantic piece. Um, and then that, that was kind of my breakthrough. What about, what about, did you have that moment or was it more gradual? That's great. Yeah. I, I would say there were, uh, I'm going to say along the path, there were three sort of breakthrough moments for me. One was accompanying a choir in sixth grade. The second was actually Chopin piece for me as well, playing a Chopin waltz, uh, getting into the, to the seventh grade. There's such a gateway, you know, you've gone from playing these kind of kid-like pieces to, to you, you have something that's accessible, but that just really sounds like something. Yeah. yeah that was a second breakthrough. And then I was fortunate to study with a with a tremendous, tremendous teacher uh, as a, uh, when I first started college. And, and I had a really great jump in, in ability and technique studying with him. And that, um, that was, I was really loving it by that point in time, but that was an, an enabler for me mm-hmm. to really be able to do some things that I was not able to do before and the, be able to have that rapid growth quickly with him. So I would say those were the three points for me, but that, uh, that, that accompanying experience and then being exposed to something really beautiful and, and meaningful uh, those were the, those are the big ones that said, you know, I want, I yeah. like this. I like this now. Um, there are moments when practicing can still be a drudgery, but you start to see that uh, there's, there's something very rewarding at the end of it. You know? Yep, for sure. And that, that's actually, I've, I've mentioned that uh, on a, on another episode and we weren't talking about anything music related actually, or, or we were talking about politics, I think, but, but the idea is that you have to do all of these, these little nitty gritty things that are very, um, you know, monotonous, or it just doesn't look attractive, you know, it, it's, it's very un, unappealing. Uh, but then yeah. added together over a long period of time, you you can produce something beautiful. And that's, that's what's amazing, I think. Yeah, this comes up a lot here around the academy with our students. So my students, they joke and all they all know that I, there's a word I don't like very much. I don't like the word fun very much. Okay. Like, oh, Dr. Russell doesn't like fun. And it's not that I don't like having fun at all, you know, but the, the idea is we think that things should sometimes should be, be fun. And I see this come up in art class a lot. You know, the students are learning to, to draw, to paint, and uh, they end up producing all of them, whether they had any skill when they came in, they produce some things that are really beautiful and inspiring. Uh, but the path to get there is is not always fun, that sometimes it's a lot of tedious, hard work the end result is something meaningful and rewarding, deeply rewarding at times, but yeah. the path to get there is not always fun. And, and that comes up a lot here in the school and they, they start to experience that firsthand in, in, in choir, in, in arts, in, in math, you know, all of these kinds of things. You know, in, in, uh, we have a robotics team and programming the robot mm-hmm. that some nights they're very frustrated with that, but the end result <laughs> is, is really, is really yeah. exciting. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Uh, not to nerd out, but what uh, have you played Chopin's um, Etude, I think it's number eleven. The, the, the windmill. I think it's called. Yeah, 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 I yeah. And uh, so I, yeah, I love the Chopin. I've played a lot of the etudes. Um, wow, the, that's uh, very the, impressive. Uh, the Alien Harp was my first one. The Revolutionary is one I play often. Uh, Winter Wind. I just, I just. Winter love Wind. Chopin yeah, etude. yeah. 
I may have I may have named talked about the, the wrong one, but the one of the hardest ones. Yeah, the winter uh, yeah. wind is definitely one of the the hard ones, and and yeah. that's a that's such a great piece. Chopin's a big favorite of mine. Franz Liszt Liszt is. I was gonna I was gonna ask you about play. next. Have you played Have you played La Campanella? Uh, I played La Campanella. Yeah. Oh my gosh! I, okay, I want to hear you play uh, Mazeppa, that. Mazeppa is a great is a great piece. Uh, I play the the Dante Sonata, the the one that's the essentially Liszt's depiction of Dante's Inferno. That's my favorite. Oh, okay, piece yeah. To play. Wow, okay, probably cool. my very favorite solo piano I, piece. I encourage. I think one of my favorite pieces is La Campanella, but I I'm trying to learn it, and it's it's very very difficult. I mean, we'll we'll see if we get that. But but if people are listening, go and listen to La Campanella. Go listen to a a, a YouTube recording of it because it's it's just amazing. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> oh, oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Listen to those the transcendental etudes of List. They're great, and mm-hmm. uh, this is you know this is the this music and uh, and it reflects the culture in which it was written so so well oh, and, yeah. and uh that's one of the things that's great you look at those those middle of the, the 19th century romantics list uh the the chopin brahms um schubert they, the, the the literature that they were reading you know is so heavily reflected in their their yeah. music I, I feel like a super obvious one is debussy because that was when uh impressionism started happening absolutely like, absolutely yeah. you see the painting you see the the music i think personally i think there's a there's a um, correlation in his philosophy you know what mm-hmm. the kinds of philosophy that he was he was studying a lot of the influence of eastern art and and uh, and uh, and religion and philosophy i think you can hear that in his music mm-hmm. um you know within the chesterton curriculum uh teaching the the modern literature class this year with our, our uh, seniors and we studied uh, goethe's faust looking at faust yep. and mm-hmm. you know schubert franz schubert in the 1800s wrote some of his songs based on the text from that book uh, you know oh, wow. gretchen at the spinning wheel gretchen am spinrad uh, you know, piano cool. and and singer, and you can hear in the piano part is the spinning wheel, sort of the the monotony, the stuckness of nice. the, this kind of, of stuck where Gretchen is at at, the, at her song, and then the singer sings the text. It's it's really yeah, again, I I know it's I get yeah, I get no, really excited yeah. about these things. But know? but yeah, my, my friend, my my previous roommate, and and he was a, a very brilliant uh, engineer, or he is he is a brilliant engineer, uh, but he had a musical. Um, uh, hobby on the side and that's what we find sometimes the more mathematically inclined sometimes go towards music as well um Absolutely. which is interesting but but yeah. he would talk about the humor in some of these pieces and we're we're not talking about pieces with lyrics or anything it just just basically piano pieces and and i i was an interesting concept because i hadn't thought about that but he, he tried to explain it and and i was very interested i mean w- do you have anything to do you, do you, does that bring yeah, a bell? Yeah, yeah. Right. okay. So I, I, yeah, I love, I love humor. I love the sense of humor. You know, I joke a lot of times that we are serious musicians. No laughter here, but no, it's. I love the humor, and sometimes it's subtle. You know, one of the composers that I think actually had a great sense of humor, and, and nobody really guesses it is actually Beethoven. We think mm. of Beethoven and the fire of Beethoven, but there are some of his pieces, especially some of the kind of the earlier, lighter classical pieces, where you know he is this. He to me is the ultimate Western goal-oriented thinker. You know, every phrase is going somewhere. There's high points of the piece, and there yeah. his cadences here and there. And but there's one, you know, like his his D major sonata, the Opus 10 D major piano sonata. There are it just stops and starts all over the place. Da, 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 da. You know, it's it's just going on and it stops. And then there's a little short phrase and it stops. A little short phrase and it stops. And it's <laughs> it's just going on. There's just this sense of of, of humor that's it's it's uh it's subtle it's really subtle but um but i i think that that uh, i think it's very present there but yeah. kind of the lighthearted side of this that's super funny i i think i remember someone telling me what beethoven said when he had written his sixth symphony right after his famous fifth one the dun dun dun, dun right. is his, his fifth one and uh i think someone was asking him why does everyone like your your fifth one way better than your sixth one uh and he's like oh because the fifth one is so much worse <laughs> i think he said something up along those lines <laughs> which is super funny i mean it's just hilarious to yeah. throw the popular person under the bus <laughs> that's right that's right exactly i know this reality you know the uh, the famous uh the famous sort of love melody in Rachmaninoff's second uh, uh, in the Rachmaninoff's uh, Rhapsody on a Theme of Paganini, the da 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 da. Mm-hmm. You know that one. You know he he made the the quip after that that 18th variation. He says, and that one was for my agent. <laughs> he knew it, he knew it would sell. He knew that one would sell, and and that's it. You know, that oh, one that's was so for funny. My agent. So yeah, uh, you know, it's it's, it's tough. I mean, t- on a on a deeper level, it's tough to balance what you want to write and what the audience wants to hear what your people who listen to you want to hear because that's that seems to be one of the tensions uh nowadays at least philosophically do you write what you want to write or do you want to just express yourself or do you want to convey something 
to people who will listen to it. And I think it might be a balance. That's, that's the way I'm leaning towards. It has to be some sort of, you know, superposition of the two or something. Yeah, I think so too. There has to be a voice in there, a personal voice. Um, you have to be, I, I think that essentially, you know, why are we doing this, right? What are we doing this for? Ultimately, this is, we just had this reflection in choir today, you know, pre-concert and post-concert and, and a lot, you know, why do we do what we do? You know, we're here to, to communicate something we're here to represent you know, beauty, uh, regardless of what the music is, you know, whether it's that or not, it certainly represents the culture in which it's written. But I think ultimately understanding that the music is a gift from God to glorify God. And when we start to understand that as the, you know, the top of the pyramid, and, and then the things fall down from there, I think that starts to help to order that a little bit more. It's not just art for art's sake or music for music's sake, or, you know, what I think, what I feel. You know, but that there's some deeper purpose and meaning behind it that that I think ultimately with the, right. the, the heart yearns to fulfill, I guess. I don't know. That sounds kind of yeah, no, I cliche, agree but I think it's true. I agree. And it, it goes to show you do need you do need a baseline philosophy that is ultimately Christian. There has to be it, it does like you were talking about, it does have to go back to our core beliefs and our core faith philosophy. Um, yeah, and and we, this this is a good example of how we integrate music. We have discussions that relate to these other subjects, theology, you know, mathematics. We were we were bringing these other subjects in. I, I guess I mean this is a good example of what we would you know talk about in a in a classroom, kind of right. Yeah, absolutely. I think this very very much is is the nature of some of the discussions we have here. We have those discussions in the classroom, and I think especially as the students get towards the upper class, junior senior year. Uh, this, this conversation we're having right now is, is very much a conversation that I might have, you know, in one of my senior literature classes, believe it or not, right? That, mm -hmm. that we talk about the, the text and how does it fit into the story? And then we talk about the history, what was going on at the time this, this piece of literature was written and what was the art and the music of this time period saying and, and reflecting of this literature and culture that was written. And this is, this is absolutely, this is not an uncommon occurrence for a conversation like this to happen in a Chesterton classroom. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I, I think it's something you all, a lot of times wouldn't find at another another high school. I had a question here that what what puts what's why is Chesterton different from other Catholic high schools, you know, Catholic high schools specifically. It's it's pretty, you know, we're pretty different from other public high schools, but what makes us different from other uh, Catholic high schools? Well, I think they still keep the, the subjects pretty separate and they don't have a, a larger picture other than in a, you know, a very you know, indirect way, everything is, you know, from God and the, but, but I think we, we make those connections more, much more explicit. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. yeah the, the integration between the subject is, is something that's very, uh, again, very Chestertonian. You know, he talks about how there is only one subject, you know, and, and it very much comes to light in the Chesterton classroom. Uh, you know, we're not, we don't have a theology department as a theology class, but it's not, you know, that, that pervades everything that we do. Uh, we're looking at it very holistically, the history, the, the, the works of literature, the works of art, the culture, how does that materialize in every single class? And I think that that's, I think that's one of the very first hallmarks of it. You know, um, the, the other yeah. thing that comes up out of that then is that these students, you know, that we have small class sizes in general because of the discussion uh, and oriented Socratic nature of the classes. And so these students are having, you know, they're having very meaningful, deep and meaningful discussions over the course of the day with one another all day. And so I, we've actually in, in some ways found the, you know, the students cultivating deeper friendships uh, and, and, and uh, some of them not even you know, having this kind of longing for extracurricular activities. We have some activities and do things, but we find that over the course of the day, they naturally are having really meaningful conversations with each other around these subjects. Uh, they're getting to know each other in a deeper, more personal way. They they form more authentic friendships, and and so that's that I think is also kind of one of the character and, and personal uh, byproducts of that of that curriculum being integrated that way. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, by the way, if people are interested, I, I should probably start the podcast with this, but you know, better late than never. Uh, go to ChestertonSchoolsNetwork.org uh, if you want to learn more about the network. And I'm going to put a link to uh, your your school site specifically. And I, I, I think I'll also put the link of your promo videos that you sent to me, which are, are very Thank well you. put together. I, I'm, I'm impressed. And so I, I think people should look at those too, because you, you talk about what the students were saying. That's exactly what, 
what I, I got from those, those videos. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. There was one of them. I think I sent you a one on the Socratic method. It, it features one of our students, one of our seniors quite a lot. And then the second one is the house. We did a, a little competition between the houses last, uh, uh, last, uh, semester. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if everyone is familiar with our houses, by the way, do you want to quickly explain? Yeah, what yeah, absolutely. So, you know, coming into Chesterton Academy, all of the students are divided into a house system. It's somewhat like the, the student council system you may see in other schools, but it really has its roots, you know, in, in, in uh, Oxford, Cambridge, that ancient house system. It's an opportunity for leadership growth. It's an opportunity for a small community within the community among the students, opportunity for a little bit of healthy competition sometimes in working together. And, uh, and our students, uh, last semester, we, we tasked each house. We have two here. We're a little bit smaller school and growing. We have two, some of the schools have four houses, but uh, House Augustine and House Chrysostom uh, each made a video speaking to how does Chesterton Academy help us come together each day to find and fulfill our purpose. And uh, I think I sent you the one from Chrysostom. I think I sent Chrysostom's over yeah, to you. Yeah, which is my house, by the way. Our family's house is Chrysostom. Oh, so. all right. Excellent. That's yeah. right. There you go. So we've got a, a go Chrysostom representative yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, they they did a great job, you know, and it's it's in their words. They produced it. They worked with a film producer to produce the one minute cool. video. It's very short, so so go out and take a look at it. Yeah, take a look at that. It's in their mm -hmm. words, you know, what they see as uh, what you know what brings them together to find that purpose. You know, here as a high school student. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, so I'll put that link in the description of YouTube if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, so I I had another question, which is that what what which which uh, part of the curriculum appeals to you most? Is that going to be music? Do I, uh, oh, <laughs> I, no. I, we may have already uh, no. addressed that, but I don't know. How do I pick? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh boy. You know, I love, um, that's a, that's a really hard question. I know. Um, Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> because of the overlap. Wow. It's almost not a fair question. It's because of the yeah. overlap. You know, they talk about so many, I think that, you know, obviously the music appeals to me greatly. The mm. art part of our program appeals to me tremendously too. I love the art program, you know, like, you, you see these the students come in and the, you know maybe day one as freshmen they've never done this before and they, but over you know about I find about eight nine weeks into the the school year they're starting to produce some beautiful things. You you learn simple things like here's how to draw a line, here's how to do shading, and pretty soon they're really creating magnificent things. I think that to me me personally, you know, I love the uh, I like the the history literature sequence and uh, a lot because it is a place where you can so easily integrate everything. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's what I think really appeals to me um, is, is that. Um, that's, that, that's funny. Cause I, I, I'm kind of the opposite. I, the part that appeals most to me is math and science uh, probably because it is more difficult to integrate those. They're more abstract. Mm -hmm. it's, it's harder. So I, I'm trying to find ways to do it. And I think there are definitely ways this, you know, in statistics, that's how we, we analyze things in the world. Um, on a, on a data level, you know, we need to collect data and try to, you know, argue something. So, so that's, that's what I'm drawn to, but, but I understand the literature, uh, as well. You know, yeah. I see the, but I, I see, I, and, um, I think it's really, I think it's important to, to articulate that clearly we like to show it, you know, with our math and science program, the robotics, you know, that it's very easy for people to think classical school is just humanities and it's, it's just not the case. You know, all of the students, they take the full math and science curriculum in four years. Uh, every student is going to get up somewhere, you know, to kind of a stats or pre-calc level. They're all going to do dissections. They're going to do chemistry labs. They're going to learn physics. And it is, it's so important. It would not be the same if this was just an arts and humanities school. It wouldn't be the same. They really do learn some clarity of thinking, clarity of argumentation and studying that, doing geometry proofs. Uh, yeah. the, the analysis, the statistics, things like that. There is a clarity in their arguments that would not be there without it. It's, it's absolutely really yeah. vital. And, and to my point earlier about uh, being able to excel in whatever field you want to study. Uh, I, last year I took the Calc's two students who the seniors who had, had advanced. Um, mm -hmm. I, I took them through almost most of Calc three, which is uh, for us, it would, the book was multivariable Calc. And that is something you don't really do at high school ever. I mean, unless you're just just some some charter school that no one's heard of. I I mean, that's something you do in college if you're studying STEM. So I right. I, I took them th through Calc three. So that's that's I think uh, some good evidence right there. Yeah. 
It certainly is. That's that's very impressive. It's very impressive, and uh, but also indicative, you know, the students of well, it's 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 certainly indicative of your your leadership and inspiration to them to, <laughs> to get to that level and want to do that and be on board. And but no, they were they were and, great and, students. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I love it. and mm-hmm. you know, and that and their parents too. You know, I can't I can't speak at one of our Chesterton functions without you know, really hardly thanking our parents. You know, we know yeah. we come alongside them. We don't replace them. And and so much of this this formation, you know, the seriousness, the focus, it comes from from what's being what's being done at home and what comes from there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I have, I think, two more questions. Sure. Uh, uh, so I met you at our last Schools Network conference right. and uh, you gave a talk that I regrettably missed, um, sure. <laughs> but I heard it was, magnificent. Everyone was raving about it afterwards. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Can, can you give a few uh, tidbits of that talk that you gave? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think I can summarize it here kind of in the kind of the main nugget, the main thread through it. Um, the talk was on the, the transcendentals, transcendentals and how they are reflected in the Chesterton curriculum. So truth, beauty, and goodness. And essentially, you know, what I did was I started really with the idea of truth. That you know, on day one of history class, the first 15 minutes of the first class the students ever have with me freshman year, I tell them, you know, that we see at the beginning of the story, you know, God created, there's some truths revealed. God created all things. God created man in his image and his likeness, right? He started human history with a marriage. And then we know that that there was a rift, right? there was a fall of man. And from that point on forward, you know, all of man's actions are seeking to regain that unity with the father in good ways and bad ways. And that thread then runs through you know, everything that we study here. It, it runs through our literature, this idea of the themes of, of marriage, of love, you know, uh, you know, well done and not well done. Uh, mm-hmm. We see that all the actions, you know, as Augustine talks about, all actions reflect that longing, you know, maybe in a good way or in an, in an improper way, but a longing for an attribute of God. You know, we we seek after wealth, but who has all things but God? You know, we seek after power, but who is all powerful but God? And and essentially, we see that, and it's the the beauty that we look at in our in our art classes. It reflects that, it reflects that longing. You know, the beauty of the music we sing, the ordering of the world that we study in biology, that we study in chemistry, that we study in algebra. You know, all of these things are singing that same thing. You know, and, and they speak to this truth that God created all things. You know, and that he created us for him, you know, and that, that marriage very much reflects that relationship of God with himself and the persons and of the Trinity and, and God with us. And, and that was essentially the, the, the idea of it. And, and just tracing that art through the whole Chesterton curriculum in a detailed way, um, you, you can see that. And, and we see that, that uh, you know, ultimately the story starts off in that garden, you know, there's the, you know, the tree, the river, and you know, the marriage and so forth. And, and if we read the Bible, this mirror of scripture, mm-hmm. you end in Revelation with the new heaven, this new earth, and, the, and there we are back in the garden and there's the marriage feast of the lamb and the, the, the tree and the river, the garden and the marriage. And, and it's just, uh, there's a beautiful symmetry to that salvation story. And the Chesterton curriculum reflects that uh, very, very beautifully. Yeah. And, and I, like you said, very beautifully because uh, one of our, our points of our, of our pastor, Father Johnson, who's on the board of the Society of G.K. Chesterton, he, his point is the way we reach people, uh, if you're talking about the transcendentals, the way we, we reach people is through the last one, the beautiful, the yes. true, the good, and the beautiful. Um, and those are things that can be predicated of all things. Uh, you People don't really care about truth anymore. At least they think it's everything's relative or uh, to a certain extent. Um, I mean, maybe truly they don't, but <laughs> but that's how that's how they, they convince themselves, yes, that that's the case. And then um, the the good that also is pretty relative for, yeah, for a lot absolutely. of people, absolutely. you know? Yeah. And so how we reach people is through the beautiful. That's, that's our gateway in basically. Yeah, and, yeah. and uh, that's what we, we make, we try to make. It, apparent is, at school. Yeah. it is the way that you can bring people in and evangelize and, and, uh, but, you know, and again, I think, you know, this, I talk about, you know, the, a lot of the students will ask, you know, how do we choose the literature? What is great literature? And, you know, I'll sometimes I'll define that with the students, you know, it's, literature that is that is great that is lasting is that which is going to reflect the truth of the human experience you know sometimes whether the author realized it or not mm-hmm. and, and i think we see that in the modern era you know in the modern era of literature we, we see you know there's some reading as frankenstein we see faust all these things and 
these authors were advocating a certain lifestyle that was a very relativistic lifestyle of truth. They're starting to abandon the church. They're starting to abandon those teachings, mm. looking to science and, and then ultimately themselves as a God. But then in their literature, you, you always see conscience comes in knocking is the kind of phrase that I use in this literature. And and even I, even though I think in some ways it was subconscious, they didn't realize it. They, they've actually revealed a little bit of truth that their conscience was was poking them, mm-hmm. uh, even you know even though they were advocating for you know a little bit different philosophy or, or a lot different philosophy and a different lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was well put. <laughs> I have nothing Thank to you. add to that. Uh, Thank you. Thank so you. my last my last question is if yeah. if anyone if any parent is listening and let's say you're close to a Chesterton Academy, uh, you could look at Chesterton Schools Network. Dot org and find the map of all of the Chesterton Academy. A lot of them. They're growing. They're adding, being added rapidly. I know. Exciting. I know. I know. It's great. And uh, and if so, so if there's one close to you, let's say you're on the fence still, uh, understandably, because this is still a, a new venture. Honestly, it's we've we haven't been around for forever, but I mean we're growing very quickly. And what what can you say to maybe push them over the edge and convince them? And you know, if you don't have kids still stick around because it's probably still interesting. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, go to the school, go into the school, call the school, go into it and see what it's really about. And talk to the parents that have a student there and, but go in and, and uh, shadow, spend a day, spend more than one day, come in and sit in, in classes, see what it's really about. Don't make your decision based on what you think it's about or what another classical school you think is about or is yeah. about come in and see what's going on in the, the classroom. And, and that to me, that was one of the reasons why, why I did come on board with this was uh, when they, they talked to me about this position, I visited one of the other schools and, and sat in on classes for the day. And you see these, these kids, 14 year olds, 15 year olds uh, that are uh, excited about this material and, and uh, engaged in the discussion. And, and I thought, you know, we've got to do this. We have to be a part of this. So, uh, so I would say go in, and and see for yourself what is really going on in that in that school, and and don't just go off of what you think might be happening. Right. Yep. That is definitely the best advice. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Thank you. Well, I have nothing else. What are I think we got all of all of the things. We, we I mean we promoted the school and we did it I think in an interesting way and we got to talk about deep deep things. So it's entertaining and or insightful even if you know you're not close to Chesterton and you don't have kids. I think, I think uh, we hit all of our, uh, how all the birds with one stone. <laughs> I, I think so. I hope so. I found it. I found it very interesting yeah. and, and insightful. It's always insightful and, and uh, exciting to talk to you. And, yeah. and so I, I, really I hope really I can appreciate. take a piano lesson from you someday. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, that's right. We'll yeah. have to work well, something out. I appreciate yeah. Well, thank, thank you so much, Josh, for being on the podcast and thank you all for listening until next time. Help us to make uncommon sense more common.